I'm Chris Crusitiello, your host for the Newton Conservators Environmental Program. On our last session, we saw the wonderful photographs of Carol Smith Burney showing the flora and fauna of the Charles River. On today's program, we'd like to focus on the history of the river, the changes wrought by human intervention over the last two and a half centuries, and the present day attempts to improve the water quality and to make the river more amenable for human enjoyment and recreation. This afternoon, I'm talking with Dan Driscoll. Dan, you're from the Department of Conservation and Recreation in the state of Massachusetts? That's correct. Yeah. That used to be called the MDC? It was yeah. formerly the MDC and the Department of Environmental Management. They essentially merged the two state park agencies into one. I see. Tell me about this new bridge, this new uh, Blue Heron Bridge. Uh, well, this new bridge is sort of the centerpiece of what's been a 15-year uh, effort to restore the banks of the Upper Charles River Reservation beginning in Watertown Square and traveling to Commonwealth Avenue in uh, Newton and Weston. And this bridge is scheduled to be open uh, this spring, but as you can see with all the kids out here biking, yeah. it's kind of opened itself already. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's the major missing link along this corridor between Bridge and Farwell Street um, that we needed to build. I see. Now this bridge connects to the Watertown side across the way and the the path continues up along the river on the other side? That's correct. We're standing in Newton, and often with the river, uh, with the exception of a section of Waltham and Newton and Watertown, for the river's 81 miles, the river is the town boundary for the entire, um, from its head source up in Hopkinton. And here, the boundary is Newton and Watertown. So out there, right where those kids are on their bikes, we, um, we cross into Watertown. And then when we turn left and go up to the Super Stop and Shop, you walk into Waltham. So um, in, in metaphor, we're really bridging communities here with this bridge. Uh, well, 20 years ago, this particular section of River Corridor was um, pretty much um, abused, encroached on, um, and, and neglected and forgotten about. Um, I, I'll go back a little further to give people a context of what it was like 80 to 100 years ago. Um, B B Charles Elliott, who was really the founding father of the Metropolitan Park Commission and the, and the MDC, um, he, when he went out and walked all of the stream banks and the rock hills and the shorelines to identify for the region those areas that he thought was critical to protect, um, in his original plans was the Upper Charles River. And between 1893, which is when the Metropolitan Park Commission was founded, and 1905, they acquired between Watertown Square and Hemlock Gorge mm -hmm. in Newton and Needham about 300 acres of land along this riverbank. Mm -hmm. um, in, in the early 1900s through World War II, that land was heavily used for recreation. Its real heyday was the 1920s with Norumbega Park out in Newton, where at one time there was 3,000 canoe liveries, mm -hmm. amusement parks and zoos and dance halls. Um, World War II through the 60s, the river really fell into a state of disrepair and people sort of forgot about the importance of public spaces mm -hmm. and as people forgot about it and the river became intensely polluted from the industrial activity okay, of World War II, then all the illegal encroachments began to happen on right, the land. Right. And you were able to retrieve the river banks from those industries that had been encroaching? Yes, we started in 1991 we did a survey of the banks from the square up through downtown Waltham and identified 91 illegal encroachments. Mm. And working with the Attorney General's office, we came up with a real proactive program where we were able to reclaim the land but not ostracize and punitively punish the abutters. Mm -hmm. I think it's really important that that's a big success of this project was that my attitude was we were all guilty for what went wrong mm -hmm. 
and I wanted to really convert those abutters and encroachers into stewards of this corridor, mm -hmm. and that's actually happened in a lot of places. Yes. The, the maintenance of a, any linear corridor is extremely challenging with, with limited state resources, and we've been really fortunate out here that the community and the abutters and the citizens groups have just so much fallen in love with this place that it, they keep it clean. Um, there, there's a lot of volunteer cleanups actually happening tomorrow uh, to celebrate today, which is Earth Day. Right. Happy Earth Day, right. by the way. And um, we also have been really successful at getting maintenance agreements with corporate abutters that literally had some of the worst encroachments and now are, are actually helping to steward and take care of this area. Your plans for further future developments here in the river? Um, Right now, what we have under construction, the, five, the four sections that should be done by, by um, July of this year in a couple of months are the bridge we're standing on, uh, which will be the Bridge Street to Farwell Street connection. We're also working down in Watertown Square on filling in a missing link along California mm. Street, which connects Newton and Watertown on that side of the river. And there's a new little footbridge down there over Laundry Brook that came out really nice and gives you wonderful views of uh, Watertown Dam. We're also working up by Moody Street in Waltham, um, where we're restoring a historic sluiceway that fed yeah. one of the primary mills of this region at the Moody Street Mill, and we're doing some interpretive work there. We're also restoring some of the pathway and, and re redoing the crossing across Moody Street for pedestrians. Uh, and the fourth piece that we're working on right now is to do a connection from Prospect Street to Forest Grove in Waltham. And we've been fortunate enough to get an easement from the uh, Waltham Watch Factory, and we're going to be going behind the Watch ah. Factory with a connecting link, and we're redoing all the paths to, through a piece of woodland that gets you to Ward Ave Boat Launch, and we've completely restored Ward Ave Boat Launch. It's not quite complete, but we are, our goal is to have that open by this season yeah, for, right. for boats and fishing. And there's a, it's going to be one of the first fully handicapped accessible ah. boat launches in the region because the way we designed it, um, which we do, uh, this, en this entire corridor, I might add, is completely um, accessible for folks with disabilities. Huh. When this is all done this summer, there'll be one missing piece, which is from Elm Street to Moody Street. We're going to be putting that out for construction this summer. Hopefully that'll be done in a year. When that last piece at Elm Street is done, you'll be able to go from the Museum of Science all the way to Commonwealth Avenue huh. in Newton by Lyons Field which is 14 linear miles one way. Ah, wonderful. Yeah, Gosh. and from Com Ave heading west um, to Riverside is one of the more challenging links because they crossed the river so much with 128 and mm -hmm. the Mass Pike. Once you get to Riverside, we are working on trying to do a design for a piece of rail corridor that we took years ago and that would get you out to um, the Lower Falls in Route 16. Mm -hmm. So that's a real critical piece. Dan, while you're here with us today, I'd like you to explain what that pump station is that we saw up in the Lake District next to the flowed meadow wetland. The flowed meadow is, is actually a, a fairly natural meadow and wetland and a lot of the watershed from the surrounding Newton community that drains into that meadow when after a rain event when you have what, what would be flooding you need a little pump station there so that when the waters reach the Charles River you need to have a pump activated to take the water fast enough to get it into the river so it doesn't back up into the system and cause residential flooding. Yeah. Here we are on this windy spring afternoon on a bridge over the Charles River with Thelma Fleischman. Thelma is a longtime member of the Newton Conservators. She's lived here in Newton for many years, and she's a volunteer at the Newton History Museum. You say in your book that the Charles River of today has been described as less the work of nature than of man, who over the centuries has adapted it to meet the needs of the time. What I meant is that the Charles River in its natural state took over 86 miles to flow from Hopkinton to the sea. It was a slow, meandering, meandering river. As I understand it, uh, when the first white settlers came, they began to build mills along the river. 
For what purpose did they build those mills? Well, they, they couldn't exist without sawmills to build their heart, to saw the wood to build their houses, and grist mills to ground their corn for food. So the, these were the earliest mills on the river. And to, to create water power for them, they had to build dams, and these dams impeded the flow of the river. Over a period of time, how many dams approximately did they build? Well, um, I, th I think that there are still 20 dams across the river. Uh, some have been breached and, d you know, don't do anything, but the others are, are still there. Some are used for flood control. Mm -hmm. did, the, uh, uh, did the water level in the river change as a result of building those dams? Yes. And what sort of problems came of that? Well, see, the, the, the dams created the mill ponds, and this is where they got their water power from, by releasing water from the pond into the raceways which turned the, turned the mill wheels. And uh, if the dam was too high, because the Charles is really very short to have 20, miles, 20 dams on it, the water would back up to the dam above it. And this led to an, an infinite number of um, court cases and um, eventually to a lot of legislation. For the first hundred years or so, these were sort of family-run enterprises. They were small, uh, they, the, the dams were small, and there was enough water to go around. But then after independence and the coming of the Industrial Revolution, there was a lot of outside investment in the mills on the Charles. They weren't the local people running these things anymore. And they built bigger and bigger mills, needed more and more water. And there just really wasn't enough to go around. Lower Falls, there were six paper mills all going at the same time. And um, they, they had to go to court and decide who was going to get how much water when. And it really was never solved until uh, the Civil War, when around about that time, they started using steam power uh, instead, of, instead of water, and uh, the whole thing sort of became moot. I understand that uh, early in the 19th century, there was a large mill built in Waltham by the Boston Manufacturing Company, and they constructed a sizable dam which had an impact on the Charles River in Newton. Tell us about that. Well, that's what created what's known as the, lake, the Lakes District. I understand that the Lakes region became a very popular area for canoeing and water sports. Yes, well, uh, I think there's talk of about, what was it, 3,000 canoes a day uh, <laughs> over holidays. This, this lasted until, well, certainly to living memory. There's so many people living in Newton who, rebe you know, who remember going remember up there. Remember going up mm. to the totem pole to dance to and dance. enjoying mm. the zoo there. I'm here with Bob Zimmerman, who's the executive director of the Charles River Watershed Association. And uh, I'd like to ask him to tell us about the Watershed Association because it's been one of the major forces in the rehabilitation of the Charles River. How long have you been going at this? Well, Chris, we're uh, celebrating our 40th year uh, this year. We started in 1965 when the river still ran in colors and smelled bad and uh, people didn't like to have their living room windows look out over it. Uh, and we were seven years, I think, before the Clean Water Act of 1972 since that time. Tell me what the major accomplishments have been over the last two or three decades. The second executive director, a woman named Rita Barron, who's from Newton, still lives there, uh, did a lot. One of the first things she did was work with the Army Corps of Engineers in the middle 70s when they were building the new Charles River Dam to have them preserve uh, 8,800 acres in fee simple of wetlands in the upper Charles to prevent flooding. Uh, that's one of the, uh, the great accomplishments. That's actually being copied across the nation at this point uh, on rivers, urban and otherwise. Uh, since I've been here, I started in 1991 and beginning in 1993 we started to focus on the science of the river uh, and now employ scientists and engineers. Uh, we develop our own computer models, 
uh, and methodologies and uh, use computer mapping to understand how the, the river as a watershed system actually works. You know, where the tributaries come from, where does the water come from, how does it get polluted, uh, what does that pollution do, where does it end up, which has um, led to some pretty surprising um, understanding. Uh, of the river. I remember in 1995 when we started to make our first conclusions based on the first year, a full year of monitoring on the river, uh, that I re realized that all of the things that I'd been advocating for in 1993, had we been successful, would have corrected only symptoms. It would not have uh, fundamentally solved the environmental problems the, the river faces. So it's a deeper problem than you thought at first. Yes, I, when we started, I, I thought it was combined sewer overflows, which is when they put the storm drain and the sanitary uh, uh, sewer pipe in the same pipe. And when it rains, there's too much water and it overflows to the river. Uh, so that was a major problem then. Uh, Stormwater pollution, which continues to be a problem. Uh, in low base in stream flow, which means simply that when we get to April 15th, and after all of the winter snow and all of the spring rain, the river begins to drop back down to drought levels very quickly. But that's not the case. The real issue is the way we build cities. And we build cities to throw water away. And that causes combined sewer overflows, stormwater pollution, and low basin stream flow. That realization fundamentally changed the um, direction of this organization was to understand how we could build cities and how we could change them to restore uh, the environment and also s sustain ourselves. Because interestingly enough, although we live in a very water-rich state, we're running out of water. Uh, and there are real reasons for that. I gather that the, uh, the development of industry along the Charles River in the uh, 19th century was a major source of uh, disturbance for the river. That is, it, it was used as a source of water power, but because of its relatively low flow, uh, it didn't prove to be an ideal river for that purpose. And yet, the building of all these mills attracted uh, settlements around them, and new industry moved in, uh, which actually didn't use water power, but uh, dumped stuff in the river. And I gather that it's been a long time recovering from the damage to, done to the river by that process of industrialization. So the history of the Charles River is really a, the history of industrialization in the United States. The first uh, uh, mill producing cloth in the United States, uh, Francis Cabot Lowell, situated at Moody Street in Waltham. Um, and yeah, the, the sediments of the Charles, particularly in the, in the last 10 miles of the river, the lower basin, uh, are, are very damaged. There's arsenic down there. There's uh, polyaromatic hydrocarbons, there's, uh, you know, PCBs, uh, PBBs, you name it. It's down there in about three or four feet of black mayonnaise that, that at some point we're going to have to deal with. Uh, a group of about 90 volunteers uh, goes out on a, I think it's the second Tuesday of every month at 6 a.m. and takes uh, water samples at 37 sites on a 80-mile river, so uh, effectively every two miles. Uh, and then we send those in for analysis, and it gives us the state of the river over time. The information is very helpful in helping us determine where we need to focus uh, our advocacy efforts to correct specific problems. I understand also that one of your major aims is to improve the river as a recreational source. And I gather that you have, for many years now, sponsored the run of the river. Uh, I just saw that a few days ago, and it looks uh, like great fun. It's now the largest canoe and kayak race in the United States. It has uh, four different basic races, a six mile, a nine mile, a 19 mile, and a 24 mile. And then there's a 26 mile professional race. Um, but we get anywhere from lows of 11 or 1,200 paddlers up to highs of 2,100 or 2,200 paddlers each year out on the river. The reason we do it is, is to reintroduce people to the river. The river is very, really quite rural and um, quite pretty. It, you get out there and the great blue herons and the black crowned night herons, uh, it's very attractive. We're interested as Newton conservators to reacquaint people in Newton with the value of this river right next door. And we're really very grateful to the 
Charles River Watershed Association for all the work that you've done in trying to bring the river back to a state where it's enjoyable for everybody in the uh, neighboring cities. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Even though it was a rainy day, there were over a thousand hardy souls out in their canoes and kayaks. And here's a stretch of the river in Nonantum at Bridge Street with rapids. Most of the racers are quite adept at getting through these. For those who tip over accidentally, there are rescue teams on shore to help you out immediately. Part of the river, especially in the lake region, is smooth paddling for quite a stretch. But remember, there are dams in the river and you can't paddle over those. So you have to get out and carry your canoe or your kayak to the next smooth spot where you can put it back into the river. They call this portaging. Some of the stretches where you have to portage are relatively short. But just look at these folks who had to portage through the streets of Waltham and between buildings with a policeman stopping traffic before they could reach the next place to get back into the river. Most of us are not racers like this, and I want to assure you that anyone can enjoy a quiet canoe or kayak trip in many places along the river, especially the lake region. And you can rent a canoe or a kayak at Norambiga, just beyond the Marriott, if you don't have one of your own. We're here uh, along the Charles River this afternoon and having a conversation with Norman Seaman. Norman is a resident of Newton and he's a member of an advocacy group called the Stream Team. Tell us about who you are. What is the Stream Team? Well, uh, Stream Teams are uh, volunteer groups that have been uh, created um, by a program called the Riverways Program mm -hmm. that um, is um, sponsored by the uh, Department of Conservation and Recreation. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a state-sponsored pro program. And the purpose of Stream Teams is to provide grassroots advocacy for the various watersheds uh, in Massachusetts. How big is your group? How many people are in it? Well, right now we have about 10 active members, and um, it's the same group that has been together for a number of years now. We've become very cohesive, and we have a, uh, a very uh, broad age, age range. Mm -hmm. uh, until recently, our youngest member was in high school. He's now in college, mm -hmm. and our oldest member is 92. Mm -hmm. Now, as I understand it, one of your activities is directed towards the boaters, that is, the people who use canoes and kayaks on the river. What sort of uh, ac activities do you do in that direction? We realized that people don't always know where they are along mm -hmm. the river. Um, and so how do you help them? Well, our latest project um, has been a, uh, a project that we were fortunate enough, enough to get a small grant for from the state of Massachusetts, and that is to uh, uh, have uh, signage created for both the boat launches uh, at various points along our stretch of the Charles and also to identify all of the overpasses that a canoeist or kayaker is passing underneath as they're going either upstream or downstream. And I'd like to show you an example. Oh of that yes, if please I may. do. Okay. Um, this is an example of a sign that will be installed starting this summer um, that will be in this case posted right on the bridge behind me. Right up here? Correct. Yeah. And um, this will be actually facing on the other side of the bridge because that's the side that is facing towards Boston. How about the cleanup situation on the river? Are you, uh, are you members of the stream team involved with that as well? We are as well. Um, there is an annual uh, Earth Day cleanup which coincidentally is taking place tomorrow. Mm -hmm. 
uh, that uh, uh, occurs every spring, and the entire length of the Charles River uh, is um, uh, is cleaned up by volunteer groups at uh, uh, all of the points along the Charles. Uh, our particular group has been very active in that program and we have actually been the coordinators of the volunteer groups um, which can range from brownies, cub scouts, uh, all the way up to elderly groups mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we make sure that the, uh, the groups are at the appropriate places, that they have all the equipment mm -hmm. uh, and that they have some fun as well. And what we found uh, in our work is that uh, attention was not being paid to the um, uh, fish ladders along the Charles River, um, partially for budgetary reasons. Uh, as you know, re resources are scarce, and we felt that we could both advocate for the fish ladders and actually do work on the fish ladders themselves. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, fortunately, we were able to rehabilitate the um, large fish ladder that is at Cordingley okay. Dam mm -hmm. in between Newton and Wellesley behind the uh, Gregorian Rush. That's the one at Lower Falls. That's the one right. at Lower yeah. Falls, and it's a beautiful spot. And um, uh, there um, is fast-running water there, um, particularly in the spring when you have the melt. And um, it's, it's a great place to visit. I recommend it to um, residents of Newton um, as just a fun spot. The fish ladders help the fish to travel around dams as they come in from the ocean and travel upstream to breed. During late May and early June, when the alewives run upstream, you also find many fishermen out in the river waiting to catch them. But there's a limit. Such a pleasure going down this river in a canoe. You can see it from an entirely different point of view. You realize what a treasure this is for the people living in Newton. For information about the Newton Conservators programs dedicated to preserving open space in Newton for public use and enjoyment, please visit www.newtonconservators.org. Our website has lots of information about the natural history of our Newton parks, together with all of its walking trails. It also has beautiful photographs and tells about the conservators' activities. And remember, you can order our walking trails booklet online. Our website also has links to other conservation groups that you learned about on our program today. The Charles River Watershed Association, the Stream Team, and the State Department of Conservation and Recreation. We thank their spokesmen for participating in this show. Copies of these shows in the forms of CDs and videotapes will soon be available at the Newton Free Library.